Hey there Lakeview, how are you guys doing? I'm here to make a video and go through um, some things with scatter plots and trend lines. So I've got my marker board, I've got my markers, but you know what? It's too nice outside. Let's take it outside. of a strong positive correlation. So if you look at our, our um, points, they're really close to, I have a bat because I don't have a yardstick at my house, but they are all very close to that line when I put it down and that line is going up. Can you zoom in on it, Brady? So this is an example of a strong positive correlation. And then I'm gonna have some help with the other ones. All right, go ahead. All right, I found some people in the neighborhood to help us out with our other ones. Ahead, this is an example of a weak positive because it's going up, but they're not exactly all in a straight line. All right, here's our next one. So here we have a strong negative. negative. So I'm going to put the bat down and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. A strong negative, so the lines are going down and they're not all over the place. And the the line is closer to the bat. But here's our next one. This is an example of a weak negative. So I'm going to put down the bat and Brady's going to take it over. It's a weak negative because it, the bat is going down and how the dots are like all over the place. All right, so this is an example of no correlation because there's nowhere for me to lay my bat. So I'm going to let Miles take it from here. Um, the, there's nowhere to lay the bat because all the dots are crazy. Okay, so for these we have to figure out what they are. So for this one, I'm going to lay my bat down and it looks like the bat is going up or the line is going up and the points are really close to it. So what would that be? Strong positive. Strong, strong positive. positive. Alright, so write strong and Brady below him are positive. Okay. So this is another one to decide what it is. So we have our points. I'm going to lay the bat down. It looks like I should lay it this way so it's close to my points. And to me it looks like my line's going down and the points are not very close to it. So what would that be? A weak, weak negative. negative. Weak negative. All right, go ahead and write that down, guys. So the next thing we're going to look at is using a scatter plot to make a prediction. So you'll notice I already have my scatter plot drawn and I have my line in there. So on my x-axis, um, that represents the number of weeks we're in quarantine. And then the y-axis represents how many Netflix shows I have binge watched. So um, that's definitely something that I'm doing to pass the time here. Um, so there's a representation of that data. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that data and I already drew my trend line in there. Notice it's in the middle of my data. I have about the same number of points above and below it. So we're going to use that line to make predictions, which is actually something that's going on um, in the world right now. So with all this coronavirus, um, it's a great time to be talking about linear modeling because that's exactly what they're doing out there. So they're taking the data they have and then using that to predict how many people are going to get sick, how many um, when we expect that to happen. Um, the only difference there is a, is a little bit more involved because it's not just a straight line that these that, that is the pattern. So um, they're working with a little more complicated math, but the same idea. So um, this is a great time for you to see where the math applies. Not such a great time for the nation and everyone um, getting sick, but it does show how we can use math to make predictions that really matter and actually in this case can even save lives. So um, in our case, it is a linear model. So um, we do have that straight line in there, which means um, to make our prediction, we're going to use our equation of a line, which is that y equals mx plus b. All right, so on our line, in order to fill in our equation for the y equals mx plus b, we have to find m, which is the slope. You know what, I'm going to write that in there. So when I go over to my equation, or I'm sorry, over to my graph, 
I'm looking at two points on my line. So they don't have to be part of the original data set, but they do have to be on your line. So if you have one that finds, falls perfectly on your line, you can use that. But if not, you just need to pick out two points that do. So um, I don't have my grid lines here, but normally we have those. So we're looking for something that like matches up nicely on the grid line. So the points I chose to use were four, two and 12, five. So those are the points that I'm using to find my slope. So to find slope, we need to find rise and run. So I need to figure out how much I'm going over and how much I'm going up to get from point to point. Um, we need to be careful here too that we're not just counting squares um, because sometimes our scale doesn't go by one. So in this example, we're going two, four, six, eight. So um, we have to be careful. So here I'm going from four all the way up to 12. So from four to 12, I'm going up or I'm sorry, I'm going over eight. Okay, from here to get to two to five, I'm going up three. Um, another way we can do that is if you can't just kind of reason through it um, with the numbers, is you could just subtract them. So if I took the 12 minus four, that's how I would get my eight. If I took the five minus two, that's how I would get my three. So that's another way we could do that. So we're gonna take that information down here to our equation. And um, we're going to plug that into our equation. So I've got my y equals. And for the slope now, I'm going to plug in the rise over the run. Let me go back up there. When I look at that, my rise is how much I went up. So I went up 3. And then my run is how much I went over. So I went over 8. So then when we go back here to our equation, we're going to put our rise, which is 3, over our run, which is 8. And then our x is still in the equation. And the other thing we need to fill in is the b. So the b value in our equation we've talked about is, the, is the, either the initial value or we can call it the y-intercept. So I'm going to stand up here and go back up here and look at my graph and look for where it crosses the y-axis. So remember, across this way is my x and up and down is my y. So if I look here, it looks to me like my graph crosses the y-axis at about a half. So um, a lot of times when we're working with real data, our numbers aren't pretty, so sometimes we have those fractions and decimals in there. So if it's a half, it's a half. So that's just what I'm going to plug in right here. So that's how I would write my equation for the line of best fit. All right. Next thing they're going to ask us to do is to use the equation to make predictions. So um, I guess I didn't explain my situation up here. So what I was using as my problem situation is for the number of weeks of quarantine down here on the bottom. And then here would be the number of Netflix shows that we've binge watched. So um, we can use that data to make predictions. And actually right now, are you on the graph or on me? Graph. Come to me. All right, so actually right now in the world, what we have going on with the coronavirus is a great example of how they're using data they have to make predictions. So it's not always 100% accurate, um, but this is the process they use. It's just not linear for what they're looking at, but they are. They're looking at the numbers, they're looking at the trends, and they're using that to make predictions. So that's what we're gonna do down here on our last piece of sidewalk, is we're gonna use the equation we just made to predict the number of shows if we were in quarantine for 12 weeks. So if I go back up here to my graph, if I look at the number of weeks, let's circle that real quick, it is along the x-axis. So that tells me that when they give me that value, I'm going to plug that equation into um, for an x value. Versus if they gave me the number of shows, I'd be plugging it in for my y value. So where it falls on the axis is going to tell us. So when we go over here to make our prediction, I'm going to use my equation from the step above up there. So first thing I'm going to do is just rewrite that here. So we're using our y equals 3 eighths times x plus 1 half. Oh, I lost my 
meh, it's a messy one half, but it's still a one half. All right. Um, so here, if we want to predict for 12 weeks, since like I said, our number of weeks was on the x-axis, we're going to go ahead and plug that in for x. So I'm going to give you a minute to plug that in and see what you come up with. So how many shows would you predict that we would watch, binge watch in a 12 week quarantine? have 12 weeks of quarantine, then um, I, you would expect me to have binge watched five different shows. All right, so let's take a quick recap at all the things that we have gone over here today. We talked about the difference between a strong positive and a weak positive correlation. So for strong, it means that the points are very close to making a line. For weak, they're all over the place. So um, they're both positive, though, because both of those trends are going up. We also looked at strong negative and weak negative. So for the strong negative, our points were very close to forming a line. Um, and for the weak, they were more spread out. But in both cases, the trend was that as our X was getting bigger, those points were going down. And then finally, if we don't see any pattern in our data, we call that no correlation. So we've got our couple examples here to keep our neighbors occupied while they're walking here. There's our Lakeview math. And then we took it to a line of best fit. So we had our data. We drew a line, um, making sure that we had about the same number of points above it as we did below it and that it was close to our points. And then we took that information to plug it into our equation. So we used the rise and the run for our slope. And we looked at where that line crossed our y inter or our y axis to find the y intercept. And then the last thing that we were doing with that is using it to make predictions. So if we know um, what the trend is, what equation we're using, um, we can then plug in an X or a Y value uh, to make predictions along the way. So I hope you guys enjoyed getting outdoors with me and learning some math. And um, I'm so proud of the work that you've been doing. I miss seeing you guys and I hope that you're all doing well and staying healthy.